Um, Steffi, we met about a year ago when uh, we started to work um, on the German refugee crisis and how to actually organize the entire thing a little better. And we've actually followed through from how does that work, who's actually here, what drives it um, coming to Europe, how do you actually get better and faster on the core asylum issues, and now we've actually moved on to integration. And what we've heard um, this morning also in some of the heated debates in Britain um, around Brexit, here in Brussels more than ever, it drives opinions, it drives emotions, as we've seen. It drives elections, as we've also seen in Germany yesterday. We've seen it on a Brexit vote, and we're going to see it in a couple of more pretty important elections um, across the EU actually coming up. So now more than ever, um, do we think it's actually important to highlight what the opportunity behind this is. Nobody wants people having to flee their country. And nobody wants inequality. But that's a fact um, in some of the geographies people live in and come from. And therefore, um, we looked at it from an analytics angle, as we do at McKinsey. And um, we started working on a report on global migration and really wanting to understand, is this a fad? Is this really a flash in a pan? Is this catastrophic like we've never seen it? Are these actually patterns, are these different patterns that are emerging in global migration? And is Europe a special case in that? Is that what we're seeing in Europe, what we've seen for the past year? Is that special? Is it just special to us because we see it so close up and we've never seen it like that? Um, and to come with my conclusion up front, um, Europe is a very special case um, in global migration. We've seen nothing like this since the post-World War II era. Um, it's a special case, and we think it's a new normal. It's actually here to stay. The fact that right now we have less people arriving uh, is driven by political conditions, it's driven by um, certain will, but the facts that are driving the migration logic, and in particular migration now from developing to developed countries, is actually a new pattern we're seeing. There's never been, since post-World War II, where there's data on it, such a volume of people migrating from developing to developed countries. Because typically people flee, and they flee from their home country, and they flee either internally displaced or they flee in neighboring countries. And this really is why Europe is a special case. And I would just like to leave you with two messages on why that is in Europe, and then what is the opportunity and also the moral imperative, we think, at stake to actually get this right. So just real quick, um, as you certainly all know, but I'm talking about this internationally too, so there's a couple of facts up front. So we had about 10% of the forced migrants last year um, coming into Europe, about two and a half uh, million that was. Um, those two and a half millions, they broke down in like the three top countries, which were Syrians, Afghanis and Iraqis. And what you note is these are all countries that are relatively far away. Um, so one of the first uh, insights of this, like we were wondering, why do people actually starting to make that journey now? So it's a far journey. Um, we took out the example um, of a Syrian, and we were just outside standing with a young um, gentleman who's now here in Offenbach uh, studying and who's, who shared his journey on the way um, from Aleppo to here. We would have loved to have him on stage today, and actually I would have loved to bring him um, on stage and discuss with me. He needed to leave, unfortunately. But we looked at this. And when you just look at the numbers, a typical refugee journey is on average 100 kilometers in parameter if you get displaced from your area. And you need to cross one border, if any. That's like typical patterns when you look at large numbers, globally migration patterns worldwide. So now recently, when you look at the Syrian case, for instance, you go 30 times as far to go to Europe or to Germany in that case. And you're crossing 10 borders. And you wonder what... what drives that and what's actually the logic and why is that pattern actually so different. And what we see and what we saw emerging from all the numbers from the destination countries, from the countries of origin, is we see actually a two-step logic almost in this. So one is the impetus of people needing to leave their country. So there's war, I'm individually prosecuted, it's just hard to, there's reasons for me to pack up and leave. But then there's a second step, and here's where the choice actually became different in the recent European refugee crisis. There's actually the choice of, of destination country, if you will. So this logic of more people saying, if I need to go pick up and go, um, because I'm not safe anymore where I'm at, this making a conscious choice of where am I going to? What's driving those decisions? A really new pattern. Um, again, we already had that at one of the previous DLDs, how social media obviously is driving that, or one of the drivers, actually. 
Um, and this two-step logic is really something that brings us to, and it's also um, it's merging two-step logic. It's merging um, the the forced migration streams actually and brings it closer to voluntary migration, so other much larger international migration patterns. And that's why we think is really interesting, and why we think Europe is a special case of this. So larger volumes than we've ever seen, further destinations away than we've ever seen. Um, and we do think it's an imperative, actually, for us to get it right along three dimensions again. So for one, it's a moral imperative. It's where Europeans, uh, the Treaty of uh, Geneva and the basic human rights, something that also we need sometimes probably to remind ourselves this is still a core driver and a core pillar in the entire European refugee crisis. Secondly, that was my point before, why I think this is actually new normal. When you look at it largely, what drives such a far journey, when you look at it, what enables people to come, it's the first situation in the countries of origin, like I just said, so there's war, there's economic hardship, there's inequality. Secondly, there are certain self-reinforcing patterns. So I know people who are there, there are traffickers who bring me, it's just more commonplace that people actually pack up and go further than they probably used to go previously. Thirdly, um, it's the point of inequality. So it's the point of as long as we live in such unequal terms, and it's actually transparent on my fourth point through access of information. And I can see it every day on my smartphone, whether it's in Rwanda, whether it's in Yemen, or whether it's in actually Syria. Like this is also a core driver to see, like I see the inequality, I know people who already made it there have a terrible situation at home, and there's actually an easy path to go there. And the last point was, um, there's actually a feasibility of reaching Europe. So there was, routes, the Mediterranean route, there was the Balkans route, so it was actually a feasible, almost organized way of getting to Europe. And the only reason why we think the numbers have, got, have come down so much in the past half of the year is because the fifth element, the feasibility of reaching Europe, has come down for multiple reasons. It's like Balkan routes shut down, the EU-Turkey treaty, so now there's actually less of ability to come to Europe. But when you look at all of those drivers, and uh, wouldn't dare to wait them, but I think there's certainly a correlation between them. You'd say, well, the fifth one has gone away for now. Um, there are probably different opinions in the room how stable this is going to be, that this feasibility of reaching Europe is, uh, is uh, not changing. So therefore, we really think there's a new normal in the era of migration, because that fifth is probably not going to hold. So the question is really, if that is still the case, if we can't work on inequality, there will always be access of information. There will be terrible things happening around the world, people needing to leave their place of home. There will be a stronger um, pull towards, um, towards Europe in the case of global migration. Um, and therefore, we think we actually need to properly handle it, because it's, it's probably here to stay, and we also think it has an upside. This preliminary, we're publishing the report um, at the UN Refugee Summit in two weeks. Um, we think it has an upside just for the EU between 60 and 70 billion of the refugee cohort that just came in last year. So just that 1.1 million that's likely going to get the right to stay out of the two and a half uh, that came in last year. <laughs> we think 10 years out, uh, entirely acknowledging that now there's cost associated to this for proper integration, I'll speak to that in a minute, we think there's actually a strong upside case in Europe um, to get that migration element actually right. So why do we think that? It's a mix of factors. One is the age structure um, of the cohort coming in, so we are an aging, we're an aging continent. These are people who are very young who actually come in, uh, could be part of our workforce. B, right now they're relatively low skilled, but they're also very young. We have some of the best school and university systems in the world across the continent. So if we do phase them into our educational systems right now, we do think as a third point, they have likely at least even, if not better, chances of outcomes of previous migrant populations. So we compared, the change in stock in terms of age structure to what would happen if they had similar economic outcomes to previous migrants we had in the population. We actually do think if we make a conscious effort, and we have like obviously a base case and aggressive case behind that, but 60 billion is probably the number we come out with 10 years out, could be an annual contribution if we get this right. So how do we get this right? Um, you can't change the conditions you have in the country in terms of how prosper it is right now, what's the GDP like, what does the labor market look like. So this is a factor you probably cannot change. Um, you can also change only very little the composition of the refugees you get, so in terms of the age mix you have and the skill mix you have. So you only have the level of integration. They need to be very active 
in terms of your activation rate, how quickly can you actually get them into the labor market and uh, under what conditions? Um, what is your then employment rate? So how quickly can you actually properly get them employed and productive in society? And then what actually the wage levels, how you can move them up through the cohorts? So I could go on on this forever, but the imperative is we think, um, A, it's here to stay. Just to recap, it's really here to stay. Uh, secondly, just because it's quieter now on some of the shores does not mean the problem is gone. Actually, the work is only starting now because people are here and they're very likely to stay, uh, almost all of them who came in last year. And C, there is really value at stake for uh, European economies, European societies, and stability as a whole. So um, now more than ever, do I think has the EU and European countries as individuals a role to play to make integration work. Thank you very much.